All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the very first uh, Public Service Perspectives uh, session for this academic year. This is part of a series we offer every month, um, a um, series of, of views and insights from a leader in environment or public sector um, work that uh, can really lend some experience from a practitioner's perspective. And uh, we're very pleased today to Welcome Stephanie McLeod, who is Chief of Staff to Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Um, I'm gonna read her bio here for you. On January 1st, 2023, Stephanie McLeod was appointed as Chief of Staff to Governor Mike DeWine. She serves as Chief Advisor to the Governor and leads the execution of the Governor's strategic priorities. Prior to this, she served as Administrator and CEO of the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation since 2019. McLeod has an experience, is an experienced executive with a diverse background that encompasses more than 20 years of experience in public administration and workers' compensation. Before coming to the DeWine administration, she served as senior vice president at Sedgwick Claims Management Services while managing her private Columbus law firm, McLeod Law, LLC. She began her career as a staff attorney at BWC before serving as legal counsel to both former Governor George Voinovich and the Ohio Department of Transportation. She later joined the office of former Attorney General Jim Petro, first as senior deputy attorney general before advancing to chief counsel. McLeod is also a former Truro, am I saying that right? Truro, you Truro. are. I always struggle with that. Township trustee and an active community leader. She served six years on the counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists. She also served on the board of the Mary Haven Behavioral Health and Addiction Treatment Center for over a decade. During the peak of the COVID pandemic in November, 2020, McLeod was appointed as the director of the Ohio Department of Health. Not a small job during that time, I would just like to add. Uh, Governor DeWine chose Stephanie for her knowledge of state government and management expertise, which were both needed during the pandemic. She continued as director for 10 months until her, until her return to BWC as administrator in August, 2021. Stephanie earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from Ohio University and a law degree from Capital University Law School. She was a recipient of Columbus Business First 40 Under 40 Award in 2010, and in 2019, she was selected as a Woman to Watch honoree by the international publication Business Insurance. In addition, she was chosen as a member of the 2021 Future 50 class by Columbus CEO Magazine. In 2020, she was awarded the Small Business Advocate Award by the Greater Cleveland Partnership in recognition of her commitment to small businesses and support of state policies that foster job creation and business growth. So you can hear from this extensive biography that Stephanie has many um, different types of interfaces in the work that you are all doing or preparing to do in your careers. And so I just uh, wanna thank you for making the trip down here and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, as always, if you're students, if you're not students or your alumni on, on the camera, you know it's always good to come home to Athens. Um, it's just such a fun drive down here for me. I don't live that far away, which is nice. For years, my husband and I were season ticket holders for the football games, um, even though he went to uh, the Ohio State University um, he's a huge fan of Ohio U and the Bobcats, so it's good to be home. It's good to be here. I've not been in this building in the Voinovich um, Center. I, of course, and I'll talk about that in a minute, I worked for Governor Voinovich when he was governor, then senator. Um, what an incredible, uh, amazing man and uh, brought a lot to my life, brought a lot to my profession. I was working for him very early in my career. And he helped set the tone for me in leadership, helped set the tone for me personally on my profession, things like that. So I just wanted to come in today. I'm going to leave time for questions because generally I want to talk about what you want to talk about. And as a general rule, there isn't much that's off the table. I'll answer questions, personal, professional, whatever you got. But um, let's get started. You heard my, and there's the governor. I'm actually, don't. <laughs> um, that's twice now. I was actually on a live uh, event 
uh, Wednesday, and he called during that as well. So um, this is, do you want to know what chief of staff is like? This is what chief of staff is like. <laughs> uh, my calendar is not my own, and um, I work closely with the governor. As you may know, he has COVID, uh, which means a lot of the stuff on his calendar got cleared. When things on his calendar get cleared, my phone blows up. Some of the worst news I can get on any given day is that the governor's calendar has cleared. Um, he stays busy. Um, COVID, not going to slow him down one bit. He keeps moving, um, making more calls, doing more things, getting more things done. If he doesn't, if he lose, if he, we have a meeting canceled with an hour block of time, he will fill it. Um, there are always things to do, and he goes, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, just kind of a little bit I'll go through quickly since you went through my history. I started as an intern in law school uh, up at, in Columbus for Governor George Moinovich, then Lieutenant Governor Mike DeWine. Uh, I was a staff attorney at BWC, then I came back. I was assistant deputy legal counsel under Moinovich. Uh, then I went to the merger on ODJFS, which if you've been around long enough, there used to be an agency called OBES, or Ohio Bureau of Employment Services. Uh, we merged that with human services to make ODJFS. Then I went over to be the chief, uh, first deputy chief counsel at ODOT. Then I was chief in the transportation section for Tim Petro. Then I was chief counsel. Uh, I became a senior vice president at Sedgwick, which is a global organization doing absence management from workers comp to uh, ADA, FMLA, those kind of things. Um, at the same time, so during the last, I was there about 12 years. During the last eight years, I dropped part-time and I was a principal. I started a lobbying firm and I started a legal firm. At the same time, I was on the board of, as you heard, board of Mary Haven, board of the counselor social workers, uh, licensing board for the state of Ohio, and I was a township trustee for part of that time. When uh, Governor DeWine was elected, I went in to be the administrator. I think WC is the equivalent of director, um, but the statute calls it administrator. And then Governor called me to be director at Ohio Department of Health. That was the challenge of all challenges in public service and of my uh, professional career and personal life. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I got the tap to be chief of staff for Governor Mike DeWine. I want to talk a little bit today about leadership. Um, one of the things that I tell people when you are interested in leadership, you always want to make your mark before there's a position available. And, you know, what do you, what, how do you do that? What does that mean? And that came from Governor Voinovich. When I worked for Governor Voinovich, he had a saying, and I have run my career by it, extremely successful and that is this he would say take care of this job and the next one will take care of itself meaning based on the job you're doing today people will look for you to enter into other positions and move up to positions of leadership based on the job you're doing today when a when a leadership position is coming open typically the person who manages that position knows that's coming open well before anyone else. The person who's vacating the position will have contacted them and let them know I'm, I'm leaving, I'm looking for a different, or I'm moving to a different position. And the first thing you need to know is that that leader is immediately identifying who can fill this role. And how are they identifying those people based on the job they're doing today? And they are thinking about, and it, it doesn't mean that your resume and your interview are not important, they are, they matter. But the job you're doing today, especially if it's within that organization, like the state, as you can see, I've been all around the state of Ohio in different agencies for over 50,000 employees in the state of Ohio. But, but word gets out based on the job you're doing today. So when that manager knows there's a position open, they will start identifying in their mind, I'd like to talk to this person, that person, this person, because I think they'd be good at that. And there's always, a, there's always a potential of a dark horse candidate that they didn't think about who applies, who comes in, and that's the person who gets it. But generally, especially if it's in the same organization, the job you're doing today is the interview. And people need to remember that because the idea that I don't really like this job, I'm going to put in a partial effort, and boy, if I can get this, job, this other job, I'm really going to give it my, my all. It's too late. You've already demonstrated how you feel about the organization and about your professional reputation, your professional integrity. You've already set those standards. Um, so this is something I've lived by my whole career. People have asked me, what are you going to do next? If you ask me today, what are you going to do next? I do not know. I have my nose to the grindstone. 
I'm working as hard as I can to do my job today, to do the best I can, and then we'll see what happens next. Just to give you an example, sorry, these were all supposed to come up at once. Of all these jobs I've had, this one was really the only one I applied for. The rest of the, well, an intern, sorry, that should have been highlighted. Obviously, I applied to be an intern. The rest of these, I was recruited for the most part. I was recruited to be deputy chief legal counsel based on the jobs, based on what I had done before. And those people, I was recruited to the chief. I was recruited based on the job I was doing at the time. So that's kind of my first and foremost is helping people understand the job you have is as or more important than the job you want. Having ideas like sometimes we hear people say, I'll hear people or, or employees say, well, you know, that's not my job. I'm like, that's okay. Probably nothing else will ever be your job. So you can get very, very comfortable. Nothing else will ever be your job because when you are hiring someone into leadership, you need someone willing to try to take on anything. When the governor called me, <laughs> I was the administrator of BWC. We were, we were firing on all cylinders. They still are. Everything was going very well. And the governor called me and said, um, would you like, what, what do you think about going over to health? And my first reaction was I started laughing and, and laughing and laughing. And finally he started laughing. <laughs> I, think, I don't know if he was getting uncomfortable with how much I was laughing. Um, but I said, um, you know, I, I obviously I, I have some concerns, but, you know, when you are in, and this is, this is going to be leadership plus public service, plus um, what we do in public administration, I said all along, we all give, once you get into public service, everybody gives a lot of lip service to, I'm a public servant. Oh, I'm just a public, you know, I'm a public servant. It, and, and at that particular point in my career, I thought it either means something or it doesn't, right? We are in the crisis of our lifetimes. And if someone calls on me to help, by golly, I'm trying. I'm going to do my best. We needed help with, you know, by that time, um, Dr. Acton had worked through a lot of the medical things that we needed to address, thankfully. Um, and it was time to roll out the vaccine. It was time to get the data updated. It was time to do a lot of logistics, which is what the governor called me in for. So saying no or no thanks, or that's not my job, um, you know, you build, you build a reputation and a career again, are you, are you all in or are you not? And that's what people look for in leaders all in. So when you have employees who say, that's not my job, um, aside from the appearance that they're not all in the secondary issue is you're losing out. Did I want to go to the department of health? Not necessarily. <laughs> Um, I came out with a bleeding ulcer. It was the most difficult job I'll ever have. Um, talk about some of that in a minute. But the experience for me personally and professionally, working under that kind of pressure, working through having some of those successes, build, trying to build the team and bring people along, was as difficult and painful as it was, was an incredible professional learning experience for me. And so for those people who say that's not my job, and, and if, if that's kind of your thought, realize you're missing out on an opportunity to do something different and to expand your own personal abilities, capabilities, and learning. So there, there's, there's two sides to that. I'm going to talk about leaders are different, different than managers. Leaders, uh, they don't get parades, manuals, or safety net. When the pandemic happened, I was talking to my board chair. Um, BWC has a board of directors and I was talking to the chair and we were talking about, you know, both the major businesses and how they were going to adapt with COVID. How was the state going to adapt with COVID? How were universities going to adapt with COVID? And I made the comment um, that I believe is true because it certainly in those difficult times that these things shine through. And I said, we are about to separate the leaders from the managers who know how to approve time off requests. Because there are people who get into leadership positions that believe that it is really just signing purchase orders and making some decisions on personnel and doing those kind of things. 
And it was exactly as I thought. We had leaders who leaned into it and said, how can I help? What do you need done? Where can I plug in? How can we plug in? And we had leaders who I would refer to more as managers who got in a fetal position under their desk. And everyone sees it. So when you think that you are kind of behind the scenes, if, you, <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you're leading an organization and you are kind of stepping back, kind of the, you know, the gif we all see of Homer Simpson disappearing into the hedge, uh, and you think that's going to be you and nobody notices it, you're wrong. Everyone notices it. And everyone notices the people who roll up their sleeves and say, where do we start? I don't know. There was no manual for that, right? There was no, it was scary. It was the scariest time in my career. It was, you know, the governor's been doing this a lot longer than me. I think it was the scariest time in his career. There's no manual for it. I was arguing with a, um, one of the legislators. I had to, that was the other thing the governor needed me to do was get us through the budget. Budget happens every two years in the state of Ohio. We're on a biennial budget. We just passed ours, but I needed to get the health budget through in a very difficult time when the General Assembly, who we have to deal with day in and day out, the General Assembly was not happy with some of the governor's decisions. I was going to be testifying before these, these members. They were going to be taking me to task. I understood all this, um, but that was the other reason the governor wanted me to go over. <clears throat> I was talking to a legislator once and he was criticizing, you know, decisions the governor had made and what had happened and you know, you did this or we did this, even if it was before me or, or during me, my tenure, you know, we did this, but, you know, it didn't, we didn't need to, or it didn't work out or it didn't make a difference. And I finally said, listen, if you had the manual or the crystal ball for this, shame on you for not sharing it with the rest of us because nobody had it. And if you had it and didn't tell us that this was going to happen uh, and you knew you had the manual, shame on you. You should have shared it with everybody because nobody else knows. Uh, what's going on. And those are the scary times, right? And that's when leaders, that's when leaders come forward. That's when leaders emerge. That's when, <clears throat> that's when you find out who's the leader and who's the manager. Um, it's, it's difficult when you're a manager that knows how to approve RFLs or request relief or, or time slips. I had People and managers who said, I didn't sign up when we were in the midst of COVID. I didn't sign up for this. Said, yes, you did. You absolutely did. We all did. Because the citizens of the state of Ohio entrusted the governor to put the right staff in place to handle whatever came. And let me explain something to you. If you have all the resources you need, meaning all the people you need, all the money you need, the stuff you need, there are no issues coming at you, no obstacles and you have no, nothing to overcome, nothing to really solve. My point was, I can pay Humpty Dumpty to do your job. Anybody can do that. When it's easy, anybody can do it. Leaders are there because it's difficult. Leaders are there because they can solve problems. Leaders are there because they don't walk away. They don't get in a fetal position under their desk. And they say, I don't know what this is. We've never had this before. I'm not sure how to solve this but we're gonna to band together and figure it out until it gets done. And those were long, long days, I can assure you. People, my, my days now are very long. Um, my days now are difficult, I laugh. Um, people ask me, it's like, how are you holding up? I said, I'm holding up great. Because one of the, the, the best thing I took away from being the director of the Department of Health is that every job after that will be easier. So that was an upside. <laughs> if you, I'm a, I'm a glass half full and it's refillable kind of person. So I'm very, I'm like the governor. You know, the governor, he is the eternal optimist. He can tell you anybody by definition that has eight children is an optimist and he has eight children, 27 grandchildren. Um, but everything after that, we had, I, I, I was explaining to the General Assembly, our short days were Sundays because those were only 10 hours. We worked every single day of the week, um, no weekends, we got, Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, kind of part of New Year's Day off. And when I say we got it off, I don't mean I wasn't getting emails and texts, things like that. I mean, I didn't have meetings from morning until night. And mothers do what mothers do. I remember my mom saying to me, how on earth you can't keep doing that? I mean, well, I don't understand why you don't have weekends off. And I said, mom, it's not like COVID looks at its watch and says, well, it's five o'clock, everybody, Friday. I'll see you on Monday. You guys have a great weekend. 
COVID's going 24 seven. And frankly, if it did take the weekend off, we would need it to catch up because we, we chased it the whole time. So leaders, leaders versus managers and understanding to, and I'll talk a little bit about that, where you fall. I would say it's important to understand when you have opportunities, we have a governor's, the governor, uh, Governor DeWine started a leadership academy. Uh, it's for all the state agencies, it's up and comers. They go through some kind of work and classes and interaction and problem solving and leadership things. And it's a fantastic opportunity. And I really wanna encourage you, if you have those opportunities, take them. They're not only, especially when you get into a position because it does two things. One is it helps those of us running it to eyeball out who are the, who are the real leaders up and coming, right? It gives us a chance to see how's your response to things? What are you doing? How are you interpreting these things? How are you leaning in? And secondarily is it gives you as an individual the opportunity to figure out where your ceiling is. Governor DeWine, I don't think he has a ceiling. A lot of people like us do. And knowing that ceiling is very important. I've seen a lot of people over my career, what I call get promoted up and then promoted out because they got in over their head. They didn't know where their ceiling was. So if you have an opportunity to do those, it's fantastic. And hopefully whatever program you're in has real world experiences. And if they don't, you ought to talk to them about it and talk about the opportunity. When I was at Sedgwick, we did a similar program. And one of the problems, we would literally as leadership look around and say, what are the issues we need solved? Here's the things that we've seen on the colleague um, surveys. Here's what we've seen, here's issues. What do we need solved? And we would give those problems to the Leadership Academy group and say, solve them. One of the groups came back and said, well, we don't understand, you didn't tell us how, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to start? And I laughed and I laughed and I said, well, you failed your first test. Because much like the pandemic, most of the problems that come to you don't have a manual. That's why they came to you. You're the leader. That's the definition. It will be a weird feeling. Um, Dr. Weinberg was talking about talking to Miranda Williams, who's the chief of staff at the Department of Health. She was my, when I was the administrator at BWC, she was my head of pharmacy. She has a PhD in pharmacy. I brought her over when I was at health to be the chief of staff. And one of the strangest things for her was making the transition. I was working with her once a week, meeting with her, mentoring her. And one of, she said, one of the weirdest things for me is going from the position of presenting my case with a recommendation to people presenting it to me for decision. She said, all of a sudden I realized there's no safety net for me. I have to make this decision and I have to own it and I have to stand by it. And that's a kind of a scary feeling when you step out onto that tightrope without a safety net and say, okay, this is me now, instead of somebody else's is always above. Talked about leaders versus managers. Um, working with Governor DeWine has been one of the greatest experiences. Governor Voinovich, early in my career, Governor DeWine at this stage of my career, watching him navigate the pandemic, watching him navigate East Palestine. When the train derailed in East Palestine, watching him snap into action, he is, he is certainly a leader for these kind of things. He is reliable, he is thoughtful. He, um, he, he's a man who wakes up every single day from morning till he goes to bed worrying about Ohioans. And that has been important to me. People have told me, I'm a good administrative leader. I'm a good, um, yeah, I'm a good leader in general, whether it's private sector or public, I'm this and that. And I always say what you need to know is good people won't work for just anybody. That's also another, <laughs> another concern you should have. So if you're moving into leadership and everybody who's below you starts scattering out, you, it may be time to start to get a mentor or do something else because that means people are concerned about your leadership. And so take that opportunity to do what you can to develop, to sit down, to talk with those people. Good people won't work for just anyone. And I wouldn't work for just anyone, but I would, I would have worked for George Voinovich or Mike DeWine any day of the week, twice on Sunday. So making sure you are a good leader. 
when I talk about, let me go back, um, you don't get parades. You, you don't get parades. Nobody, they only, <laughs> typically you get criticized when you're wrong. And when you do something right, people go, hmm. I don't know if that ever comes what you did wrong, but hmm. you, you do not get parades. I have a little thing I put in here, you know, incentive plan, your paycheck clears, how's, how's that for incentive? There's a lot of people today that I've noticed, I especially noticed it in the private sector, but I see it in the public sector too. They need a lot of accolades for the work they do day in and day out. They need a lot of reassurance that what they're doing is a good job. And that doesn't always come, especially in leadership. I told as new, you know, as people would leave the cabinet and, and new people would come in, I would try to take time to meet with them, have lunch with them. And one of the things I would always say is, listen, if you don't hear anything, everything's going fine and you're doing a fine job because there is enough stuff in the state of Ohio that requires a lot of the governor's attention that by not hearing from him, that means he thinks that you've got it and he trusts you to handle it. So look at that as a good thing. So if you're somebody who needs somebody to tell you every other day what a good, good leader you are, what a good employee you are, um, you know, leadership's probably not for you. Uh, the, the CEO, uh, when I was there at Sedgwick, the global CEO is a guy named Dave North. And I would talk about this and how people would say, oh, well, you know, I, I just need more. I would like recognition for the hard work that I do. And I said, that's great. I said, but if any of you are doing this, I don't know about it. And I just said, how many people in the room are calling Dave North, the CEO of Sedgwick, and saying, Dave, my paycheck arrived in my bank right at the right time. You took out all the taxes you were supposed to. You paid them to all the right entities. My medical card worked. I got my 401k match. You did a great job. Come on down. We're, I got an award for you. We're going to have a little ceremony. You did great. Nobody's doing that. It's, it's understanding that it's, it's a lot of hard work for professional growth and because you care about what you're doing, which if you're interested in working in state government, I will tell you, I, I enjoyed my time at Sedgwick. I enjoyed some of the work that I did in the private sector on my own, but nothing has been as fulfilling for me than public service, than state government, than local government when I was a Truro Township trustee. My husband was um, what we call a strong mayor. We didn't have a city manager. He was the uh, he was a council president in a large suburb of Columbus, about forty three thousand people. Uh, he was council president for twelve years and then mayor for twelve. And so I would do a lot of stuff with him as well. And there's been nothing as rewarding to me as helping people, as getting those phone calls of people, especially at BWC, or injured workers who said, "I got great customer service. I was scared. I didn't know what happened. They would start crying on these." calls. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get through this. And your folks talked to me through it. And that was great. And I was scared. Thank you. An employer, same way. My, you know, my, my employee was off and I was worried or this and so. Being able to make an impact on people's lives day in and day out. The, one of the most important things you can do in any job, but, but you certainly have to maintain it for leadership is, and I'm sure you've heard this, find your why. Why are you doing it? Because if you know why you're doing it, the rest of it falls into place, right? The salary, the irritations, the you know, driving in the snow, whatever it is. If you find your why, the rest of it works out. These are pictures. We talk about leadership, a leader versus a manager. These are pictures. This is all, that's Governor DeWine's farmhouse out in Cedarville, Ohio. These are all the protesters at his house every Friday night throughout almost the entire pandemic. There are no, um, and, and this is what he said, because they were starting to go after Amy Acton. They were starting to go after members of the media. And he said, come after me. Um, he, called the, he called out obnoxious protesters who targeted health chief and news media. And he said, come after me. I'm the one you want. I'm the one making the decisions. I'm the one that is accountable. And that is the difference between leaders and managers. Managers may say something like, I think what you're doing is wrong. It is wrong. That would be an accurate statement to say, but it's not leadership. It's not saying all eyes over here, all acrimony over here. There's no, um, there's no noise ordinances. He lives in a township. 
So they blasted stuff. <laughs> they blasted stuff so loud. They blocked streets with the parades. They blasted stuff so loud that he and the first lady, there's a behind his house, there's a barn back there. And they would go back to the barn away from the house and just watch stuff shake on the walls um, from the noise from the sound from the, the music they were playing. When they left his house Friday night, they would come to my house Saturday morning uh, when I was health director. And they would bring the bullhorns. So we have a noise ordinance. I live in a municipality. Uh, we have a noise ordinance. And so they would come. They had to keep it under a certain level, but they had bullhorns. They had karaoke machines. They had all of that. Um, they came to my house. And then sometimes they would go to the Senate. On Sundays, they'd go to the Senate president's house uh, or also the woman who headed up our, our liquor commission um, and protest. But it's not for the faint of heart. Um, especially in those difficult times. I had protesters every Saturday. <laughs> I was, you know, we were on calls all day long. Everybody was working from home. The first time they were out there, I was, on a, I was actually on the phone with the governor. I looked out the window and I said, Governor, your friends are here. And uh, he said, what are they saying? And I said, they keep chanting that I'm not a doctor. Um, and I said, which I'm really glad they're here. I'm going to cancel all those surgeries I scheduled to perform this week because I had no idea. So good thing they showed up. Um, they harassed my son. He was a minor at the time. Uh, he was 17. They harassed him both at my house when he was trying to get into the house. And then they followed my husband out who played music uh, once in a while. And once uh, music restarted and things like that, my husband was playing out. My son went and uh, they followed him there and harassed him. I was in Cleveland at the Mass Vax Clinic at Cleveland State that uh, FEMA put on. And I get a call from my son and he's upset. So they, they harassed my minor child. I had my car keyed. I had complaints made on my law license based on decisions that I made as health director. You just have to know that this too shall pass. There were many times, well, I'll save that for a second, but this too shall pass. I did say to, my, to the governor at one point, I said, I'm, I'm not gonna tolerate anything else on my son. And he said, absolutely not, I understand. And I said, no, no, I just, there may be a video that goes viral <laughs> if this happens again. Um, and fortunately it, it did not, governor was very supportive, um, through all of that. But there were times when I went to testify at the state house, they, you know, we had to have protection and it just, that's the hardest, right? That's the worst it'll ever be. But just understanding you will, and especially if you're interested in working in state government and you're interested in leadership or interested in elected office, one of the hardest things I cut, you can see, I started at the state, so I cut my teeth there. But one of the hardest things for people to get used to, especially if you started in the private sector and you go to the state, you work in a fishbowl. Every decision that's made is for people to complain about, for them to incite the media, to address, for people to, everything you write is public record. So if they make a public record request for something that you're working on, you have to turn it over. It is an interesting way to work. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm playing fast and loose with the term interesting, um, but it is different. So understanding that right at the outset, because, and there's a reason for that, right? Because we are paid with taxpayer dollars and they have a right, taxpayers have a right to know what's going on and what their money's going for. But it just makes things a little bit, a little bit different. There isn't always a man, uh, manual or safety net. Courage doesn't mean you're not scared. It means you go anyway. So being very careful about decision paralysis, especially as a leader, the governor frequently says, when you don't make a decision, that is a decision. Some things you have decided that either something's happening or not happening based on your lack of response and decision. And so getting decisions out the door in a reasonable manner is, is really important. And being able to stand by those decisions, just as the governor said, I'm the one you want. I made these decisions, I'm the one you want. You have to be comfortable making those decisions and not paralyze yourself. Taking calculated risks, this one's tough because I'm gonna tell you right now, that depends a lot on your boss. Taking calculated risks, some people are risk averse. Some elected leaders, very risk averse. 
One of the things I love working for Governor DeWine, he'll say, we're going to throw some passes. We're going to take some chances. They're going to be calculated, but we're going to take some chances. And the only way to advance the ball forward is to have the ability to make some mistakes. You have to. It's the only way. If everything you do has to work out 100%, you will be stuck in decision paralysis and you will not be able to advance the ball. It just won't happen because you can't guarantee everything's going to work out. So having a boss and presenting to your boss, sometimes people present, I may say to the governor, here's what I think we should do. There's a risk. This is going to happen. I want to make sure you understand that. I'm okay if that happens. I'm looking at the worst case scenario. Can you live with the worst case scenario? Okay. If you can live with the worst case scenario, it may not be great, but you can live with it. You'll get through it. Um, oops. Sorry. So understanding that, taking calculated risks, you cannot sit on something too long. Accept feedback. This goes along with my statement about knowing your ceiling. If people are trying to give you feedback, take it. Some of it you're going to take with a grain of salt. Some of it you're going to take and say, okay, I didn't realize that. I've got, we all, if you accept feedback, first of all, people will be open to give it to you and it's going to be helpful. Accept it. I was saying feedback's a gift, but I'm trying to give feedback. What I tell people is feedback is a gift and I don't want to give you a crappy gift. So I'm going to be honest and I'm going to share with you what, what we need to talk about. But being willing to accept feedback, I told when I started, um, when I met with the senior team, when I started as administrator at PwC, I said, I need you to tell me if I'm about to step in it, right? There's going to be things because I haven't been the administrator of BWC before. There are going to be things that I may think we should do, and I'm, that's not a good idea. And somebody uh, who, who I already knew, but he, he said, you know, everybody says that. And then when it comes time to tell them, they don't actually want to know. And I said, not only do I want to know, I consider it your fiduciary duty to tell me, to tell me. Now, I may decide to step in it anyway, based on something else. I may have to move forward on whatever it is, even though you're warning me off of it. And guess what? Your job just switched. Now, your job is to help me not track it around, right? To minimize the impact of stepping in it. So accepting feedback is a gift. You need to make people comfortable with that. You need to listen, not just hear, you need to listen because most people are trying to help you. You'll have a few that aren't, you'll know who those are. Um, batting 300, when I talk, the governor loves baseball, if you don't know that, he's a huge baseball fan. And so sometimes I'll give things in terms of baseball analogies. And what I say is your best batters, your top of the line batters in baseball are batting 300. What does that mean? It means they get up to bat 100 times. 70 of those don't work out, right? Just to find 30, which means you have to keep putting more ideas in and you have to keep going back at something, at a problem, knowing that most of the ideas that are being put forward probably aren't going to go. If they knew which 30 were going to be hits, they'd only get up those times and bat 1,000. But you don't know which 30. So you got to get up 100 to be a star. You got to get up 100 times and more times than not, it doesn't work out. And you have to be comfortable with that and understanding that's part of the process. That helps with that decision paralysis, putting things out there and working and understanding I've got to keep throwing all of this in. And then hopefully nobody, you know, the other thing that bothers me is, you know, when you talk to people about ideas, you, you'll have a lot of people, and as a leader, this is a struggle. They'll put ideas in, and then if you don't or can't take them for some reason, they're done. I'm done. We didn't take my idea. I'm out. And it's helping them understand that we're looking for that 300, and that all of us are putting in ideas that may or may not be accepted. Team leadership. Teams, um, one of my favorite leadership books, and there's tons out there. Um, my personal one is a book called The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. And the culture code, this was of course pre-pandemic, it was pre-hybrid, which is a different set of issues for leaders. Um, but he talks, he studies these groups, these teams that are generally successful 
year over year, despite what happens to them? What makes them different than other people who succeed, fail, 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 maybe get a you know, flying hog catches in your horn kind of thing. But he studies them and he studies, it's, it's a San Antonio Spurs. He studies, I think it's a group, I apologize, it's been so long, like Google or Yahoo. He, he actually also studies a jewelry thief ring in Europe that has stayed together and been successful. And he talks about the team dynamic and how the fundamental essence of that is trust. It is trust. It is making sure that you can trust each other to do the jobs that each of you was assigned. And having that team culture allows you to focus on your part instead of every part. And then that means if everybody's, if all the pistons are firing just like an engine, and if everybody's doing their part, then the engine's gonna run. Sometimes it runs slower, sometimes it runs faster, but it always runs. It's an interesting book if you have a chance. And, and being part of the team, if you're a leader, you wanna be part of the team from the top down. I was the chief of the transportation section for Jim Petro. We had lines at main line who came into our office, didn't have voicemail. We had three secretaries, but any number of things would happen. We'd have, you know, one, one of them's off on vacation or something. The other one is getting the mail and the third one has to go to the restroom. And if I heard the phone out there ring more than three, four times, I could pick it up at my desk and I would answer it. I answered the phone one day and I said, you know, Attorney General Jim Petro's office transportation section and the caller said, hi, I'd like to speak with Stephanie McLeod. And I said, speaking. And it was a chief from another section. And he said, what are you doing answering the phone? And I said, it was ringing. It was ringing. Now, not only did my secretarial staff appreciate the fact that I would back them up, but when they needed help, even from some of the other attorneys in the office, who sometimes would be a little it's like, answer the phones, she could say then, if my chief can answer the phone, so can you. And they would say, Stephanie answers the phone? Yes, she does. And all of a sudden it brings a lot more camaraderie to the team that all of us are there for each other. We will all back each other up, which helps function at a higher level. I got just like two minutes, I'm gonna be 15 minutes. These are just random musings. Um, opportunities, my Aunt Lucy, I love my Aunt Lucy, I'll talk about her, there's another one of her, hers. Aunt Lucy used to say, honey, most opportunities come by one time in your life. 95% of opportunities come by one time in your life. So you need to make really sure you're okay with this opportunity never coming by again before you turn it down. As you know, our people say your deathbed's full, not, not full of regrets about what you did, but about what you didn't do. So when you think about opportunities coming up, even if it's just an opportunity to expand yourself or to try something new, oops, consider it. Where'd I go? Did I punch something? Can you get me to that last slide? Sorry. There he is. If you didn't know George Voinovich, and I love him, and he would be so proud to hear me say this, he was the cheapest man I knew. Um, hands down, cheapest man you ever knew. He had to reuse, if someone sent us something that was printed on one side, like they just sent it to us or we had, we printed on two sides. But if you had something for some reason that was printed on one side, we had to save it. And then we'd run it through the copier and print the fax cover sheet because that's, we did a lot of faxing back then. Print the fax cover sheet on the back for somebody to hand fill in and we'd set it next to the fax sheet. We reused everything. 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 Um, at any rate, best you can do. I um, Early on, there was something that happened. I was disappointed in my career. And my dad said, well, honey, did you do your best? And I said, you know what? I really did. I, I don't know what else I could have done. And my dad said, then be at ease. You have literally done the best you can do. And if you've done the best you can do, then you can't have any regrets because you couldn't have done it better. Yeah, now you see. That's easy. Now you see it didn't work out, but at the time, based on the information you had at the time, you made the best decision you could make and you did, you did the best thing you could do. So relax a little bit. Bad days, I was talking about bad days at Caring Health Director. And um, you know, the governor would call me from time to time and just say, 
it, it wasn't anything more than how are you doing? How are you holding up? Especially if he knew for some reason it was a bad day for me. And the first time he did it, I said, Governor, it's just one of those days that I need to remind myself that my success rate for getting through bad days is 100%. I'll get through this one, but it's another bad day. And there'll be those days you need to remind yourself. And you think back on the things you, you've been through a lot of bad days. You work through every one of them. So when you're having those bad days, just give yourself a break and remind yourself you've gotten through your success rate is 100%. Hire for attitude, dream for aptitude. That's what I'm talking about with the team. I have passed by people who had subject matter experience in what I was hiring for, but during the interview more or less made it clear that they were doing me the favor and gone for someone else who had less of the subject matter expertise, but were hungry for the job and was going to stay. The person who's doing me the favor, what you need to know is managers look at leaders and managers both look at that and think they'll be here two, three years, and then I'll be doing this again. I'll be interviewing right here again for this spot. So I'm going to go with the person who's hungry for the job, who I think is going to stay and who I can tell is trainable. Because there's a lot of, you can't teach attitude. You can't teach teamwork. You can't teach trust. You can't teach common sense. There's a lot of things you can't teach. Subject matter, you typically can. Accountability and ownership. Um, that's a pet peeve for everyone. Just like, uh, you know, I'll just go back to the, the, the phrase that I gave when the governor said, come after me, take accountability, take ownership. Don't be afraid of it. There were times during, the, there was a time or two during the pandemic where the governor was getting challenged um, on things. And, you know, he, he is someone, he cares about Ohioans and he worries, he worries every single day. And he would say, did we, did we make the right decision? We're not getting, you know, this isn't being done. And I said, and I'll tell you, it had to do with how fast we were rolling out the vaccine. And we were being criticized. We weren't rolling out the vaccine fast enough compared to other states. But what the governor had done was make a decision along the way that we were going to reach out and try to help those who could not get to. So we were going into facilities. We were going into um, large retirement homes where people couldn't get out. And so we were taking, that takes extra time and effort, right? That slows things down. But these were the most vulnerable people. And I said, Governor, that is a decision that we made based on people in need. And we, what the response needs to be, that was a decision I made because of this. And I'd make it again every single time. Lean into it. Don't let people, because they've got other ideas, say, you know, maybe you would have made a different decision. That's fine. But I made it to help some very vulnerable people who couldn't get out to get the vaccine. And I'll make that de same decision tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. Just lean in and stand up to it. A lot of people will back off at that point. They're looking for you to waffle. They're looking for you to say, oh, maybe I made a mistake. And then they go in for the kill. Job in a bed, that was Aunt Lucy's. This is just another random musing. And Lucy used to say, honey, pick a job in a bed that you like. You'll spend a third of your life at each. What you do with the last third's up to you, but make sure you like those two. And I have, and it has helped a lot. Because if you're in leadership, you need good sleep. <laughs> It has helped a lot. Uh, some other Boinoviches that, that are just fun. We got to the end of his when he was governor. And he used to say, people would say, well, we got to do this. We got to wind down. He would get so mad. He would say, we're not winding down. We're winding up. And if you knew him, he was always so happy. And he said, we're winding up. He was, um, he was amazing. But things were always positive. Same thing with Governor DeWine. Always positive, which makes it so much easier to work around. Some other things you may have heard from him. You know, people would say, we're work smarter, not harder. He would say, work harder and smarter. Um, we're serving people. We're helping people. We're in a position to make change that not many other people, certainly in the state, have an opportunity to do. You got to grab it. And of course, back to how cheap he was, do more with less. Questions? I'm sorry, I meant to leave more time for questions than I did. Um, is anybody else warm in here or is it just... <laughs> <laughs> questions? Anything? Yes. Oh, um, yeah. So before you started your career during college, did you decide on a career goal or was that kind of out in the open before you started your career? So it was um, not a career. I did not. I was um, 
I graduated from the Honors College in broadcast journalism and thought I was going to be a journalist. I stayed, well, let me back up. My junior year, lived on High Street uh, with a bunch of people and uh, about 10 of us in a um, old boarding house that had been redone and the landlord tried to evict us. And um, we went to court and we won uh, because it wasn't, it wasn't valid, but I developed at that point an interest in the law um, based on that. Really went was working with Southeast Ohio Legal Services on some stuff, learning a ton, really enjoyed that. Started thinking maybe I would go to law school. I stayed at OU and worked on a poli-sci master's in American politics. So I stayed for a year, completed all my coursework. And then before I took my oral comps, I started law school. Do yourself a favor, biggest regret I ever had was not finishing. So I have all the classwork done for American politics. And I thought that would help me whether I decided to go to law school or whether I stayed in journalism, having kind of a, a specialty like that. Then I went to law school. I did not take administrative law when I was in law school because I didn't know I was gonna work at the state. And really where that trajectory started was working for, as I mentioned, I was an intern for Governor Voinovich, then Lieutenant Governor DeWine. And um, I'm gonna go back to how cheap Governor DeWine was, love him, but um, it didn't pay. I actually had to pay to park downtown to do this job for two years. I was the longest serving intern they had. And at the same time, I worked a second job at a small law firm downtown Columbus so that I could make money for parking and food and other things, um, all while I was going to law school full time. But I knew the benefits would, would pay off, and they did. I was in my law school classes. I talked about friends looking for jobs. You know, um, they had an opening at the Bureau of Workers' Comp when I graduated, when I passed the bar, and they said, you know, go interview for that. And so I ended up there. I knew it was good. And actually, the, the career kind of guided itself. It was more of a take care of this job, and the next one will take care of itself. Um, no, I, I didn't have a, a goal in mind. I remember being, I tell the story, I remember being a staff attorney at BWC, wondering, like, could I ever be chief legal counsel? Like, that was my big, I thought, I wonder if I could ever be chief legal counsel at BWC. That, that was kind of a, you know, out there thought or goal. And then, you know, when I did come back, I was administrator. I was over the chief legal counsel. So you don't know where it's going to take you, and you have to be open. Other questions? Yes, sir. So, Ms. Love, I guess we hear from students a lot uh, in the last several years. Right? I don't want to go work for the Democrats because I have a different book of education. I want to work for the Democrats. What would you say to the young saying that if you're looking to be involved in state local government, public service, how does that partisanship decide? Because there are goals that you can walk through and still make it. Right. Um, what I would say is if you're looking if you're looking at the legislature, you cannot step partnership partisanship aside. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to pick your tribe. Um, for state government, it is not as, as much as you might think. Um, there we have members of the cabinet who are Democrat or independent, despite the fact the governor is a Republican. He does that because they were the best person for the job. He chose them based on they, the job they were doing that day before he chose them. Um, so what I would say is in state government, if the party that you most align with is not in power, that doesn't mean um, that it's not a place you wanna work. It, it doesn't mean that it's not a place that you can't make a difference. Even if it is the, even if it is the political party that you're aligned with in power, you may not like that person individually but you still have a chance to make a difference and you still have a chance to serve people and have something meaningful and find your why. And so what I would say is legislature, pick a tribe, when you're looking at the executive and of course it's executive, you know, we think about the largest executive of course is the governor, um, 50,000 plus, and then all the contractors we use, but there's also the attorney general's office, the auditor of state, the treasurer of state and um, secretary of state. So there are also other areas. Those are smaller offices, but consider, consider the person you're working for um, 
and whether or not you want to follow that. But again, the opportunity to, to make a change. I've worked under Democrats. Um, I worked, I stayed when I was um, Jim Petro's chief counsel. I stayed with Mark Dan uh, for a period of time until I got recruited to Sedgwick. Uh, I had a great relationship with him. He, he didn't want me to leave when I left. Um, and, we, and he talked about, if you don't like the private sector, come back, I'll find a place for you. But I worked my, because I cared about the work, I cared about the people and the people I was serving, that comes out. Yeah. Um, having served more than 20 years in state government, what you say completely resonates and I appreciate you making all these points. Um, one thing that I think was really helpful to me in my career was identifying mentors and working with different people, different perspectives. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience there or any thoughts you have on that subject. Um, absolutely. Thank you. M mentors have been extremely helpful to me in my career. I still, I just went to lunch when I said I worked for a small law firm uh, when I was in law school. It was a husband and wife. Um, with two other attorneys in the office. I just went to lunch with her the other day. Um, she's been a great mentor to me, especially as a female. She was one of the earliest attorneys in Columbus, in Franklin County. She's an African-American female who literally would tell me stories about showing up at court with her client and the judge not believing she was actually an attorney and told her to go home and bring back the license. That's how long she'd been practicing. I learned tons from her and still call her and ask her when I was at BWC, when we do certain employee engagement things and we have round tables, ask her to come and share that with others as well. So finding a mentor is important. And then also sharing that knowledge. I can relay her story. It's very shocking as it is, but to hear her relay her story is much more impactful. So inviting her to come in and using her at those round tables and maintaining those relationships. Uh, the chief counsel for Voinovich, was it, when I was there, uh, the first time was a gentleman named uh, Mike Watson. He's a federal judge now. He was a fantastic mentor for me. I called him for years. And you need to be able to take that feedback. I called him before most jobs I took. I called him and said, what do you think of this? I was being recruited for a job with an organization that was struggling. And I called him and I said, what do you think? And he said, are you crazy? And I said, well, he said, they're, they're struggling. This may not, go. it's going through a transition. This may not go. And I said, yeah, but you know, don't you want good people to step in and say that? And he's like, now's not the time to do the Lord's work. Back away. Um, <laughs> and I did. And he was right. Because, and you have to be able, again, that's that feedback that you have to be able to get. And I pulled some, some of my favorite, I'm a practical joke person. Some of my favorite practical jokes were on him. I'll tell you quickly, just because I love it. There's, he was a judge, and I used to call him, I had his back line chambers, and I used to call him and leave voicemail, like whatever cases he had in front of him, I'd be like, I'm the plaintiff's wife, and I want to know when I can buy and pick up a check. I was talking to another friend of ours who told us that the judge didn't have all of his continuing legal education finished for the year, he had to report, so he was running around trying to get it all done. And the, the woman who was responsible was a woman named Diane Chelsea Long at the CLE Committee for the Supreme Court. So I called his back line and I said, yes, Judge Watson, it's come to our attention that you have not completed your CLEs for their biennium. And we don't think this is the kind of uh, example that our judiciary should be setting. So if you could please wrap that, you know, whatever. I forget about it. Six months later, he and I are on the phone and I forget what it was. And I said, oh yeah, did you get that call? He starts screaming. That was you? That was you? I called her and she denied it. And I said, I've got the voicemail. Um, so Mike Watson, Jim Petro, um, my father was a great mentor. I still call him and say, what would you do with this? He gives me great advice. Um, I'm very fortunate um, to still have my dad. Uh, but, you know, the governor, I call him on personal things. I certainly call them on professional things because those affect him. But I've had some really good mentors along the way. And what you'll find is don't, don't limit yourself to one mentor, right? Because you have different mentors for different things. Sometimes it, it's personal. Sometimes it's professional. Sometimes it's, it's a leadership question. Sometimes it's a job move question. Sometimes it's a job move question in this area. So call the mentor who's going to know the, the most about that area. So I still have several mentors. I've been around a long time. I still use them. 
I still use them. You don't have to take the advice, but at least get it. Most of the time, it's very, very helpful. And sometimes you take part of it, but not all of it. Sometimes you don't take any of it. Sometimes you take all of it. You just call them and ask. Yeah, mentors are critical. Yes. Uh, Oh, fiscal, I'm sorry. As trustee, a fiscal officer for township, small government is often overlooked. I found opportunities to start public service in an effective way here in this grassroots form of governor of government. Yes, Deb, she's exactly right. Local government, very hard. Local government's very hard. I'm gonna tell you one of the reasons, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I'm gonna do. Uh, one of the reasons local government's very hard as compared to it's hard to deal with the legislature very differently. Because at local government, there's not a weeding out process. What I used to say is anybody with 50 signatures, because that's about what it takes to get on the ballot, 50 signatures and some yard signs can be on city council. And anybody is. Um, you'll find a lot of people in local government, not all of them, I wasn't, but a lot of people are one issue. So they had an issue with their trash or snow removal or something else, and they're gonna run for city council. And so they come in with this one issue and then you've got to hope that they can transition to the broader issues and the broader pictures. Local government does get overlooked, but if you're, if you're thinking about, again, back to that public service, local government is literally where the rubber meets the pavement, right? You talk about federal government, how many things is the federal government doing that, imp that, that they're dated and they're making decisions every single day? How many of those do you know about and think, ooh, that's a problem this week? Unlike trash removal, snow removal, um, you know, stuff, stuff I, I need to get a permit for this building that I'm doing or this addition to my home and it's taking three months and it's causing me problems. That is the day in, day out, direct touch to, to constituencies. And it is overlooked. It is very much overlooked. And there's opportunities, even if you're in small government, to branch out. So literally at the time I was a township trustee and it's a little, it's hard to explain with, um, it's hard to explain with the, uh, the way our townships laid out in our city, but my husband was mayor, I was a township trustee. We had something that had never been done before. We would meet with the superintendent of schools and have lunch once a month. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? Just take the time to figure out how to best serve people in your role. And these were, you know, the, the superintendent and I probably didn't agree on everything, but we sat down to figure out what we could agree on, what we could work on, identify common problems. What can we do? How can we help? Um, so making opportunities to open communications, that is the first thing to do. I, as, um, as chief of staff, and even when I was the administrator, take opportunities to meet with all the stakeholders when I can. So the business community, the labor community, the, you know, whoever, the farming community, whoever it is, take opportunities to reach out because then when something comes up, I had developed um, <clears throat> a relationship with Tim Berga. He's over the AFL-CIO in Ohio. Um, you know, we, we had some questions about this UAW strike. I already have a relationship with him when neither he or I really needed anything, but I developed that relationship, called him, said, Tim, we need help. He helped so that we could be ready. Um, make those relationships. But yeah, the grassroots form of government, that's really the one people see the most. They see federal, but it doesn't impact them in the same way local does. Any other questions? All the time, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much.